Hello and welcome to episode 148 of Trek Live. Uh, how are you doing this morning, Dan? Uh, doing great. Uh, excited again to keep continuing the, the ship this, conversation. This kind of, yeah, ship conversation that we've been ongoing throughout this month. Uh, should be really fun. Um, I think it's going to get uh, interesting uh, as we go. I think it's just going to get only harder uh, from this point forward so it should be fun yeah no i i totally agree um the the first one we did last week with the hero ships i think was fairly easy to at least because there's not that many to choose from the, the way we define hero ships is obviously the the sort of main ship of the show or the movie uh and because there aren't that many to choose from i think it was fairly easy to to nail down roughly what was going to appear on the list. I think we both got three out of five. Um, yeah. And the, the the real challenge there was trying to figure out the ranking. Here, and then with next week, uh, I think it's, it's the, the canvas is so much more wide open, and there's so many more choices. Um, I think it's uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult to, to even get one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely yeah. confident in my, in my guesses for you. Uh, or even my own list. I think my own list is... Uh, I'm confident in it today, but I, I feel like it's one of those things that because there's so many, if I'm you know, re-watching at a different point down the road and we tried to do this then, I might have different answers uh, because other things might be more prominently on my mind. Um, yeah. But as of today, I feel confident that this is the list that I feel good about. We have Rob. Yeah, uh... at, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's it's just really tough to. Um, uh, again, I think it's it's just only going to get more difficult because I think the the array of shifts just keeps growing and growing and growing. And like you said, um, even my own, uh, I don't know if I'm, I feel as confident, uh, just like you. So okay, yeah. So this week we're doing recurring ships, which is pretty much anything that we see more than one time. Uh, that's not a hero ship, so we can't pick the Enterprise D or. You know, the Voyager here, um, but anything that you know can't be categorized as the hero ship of the show or the movie that has been uh, featured at more than one time is in this box here. Um, yeah. Next week we're going to be doing uh, our trying to guess each other's favorite one-off ships, so things that we only see pretty much one time, whether it's in a movie or a maybe a two-part episode, yeah. a single story or a single episode, one one shot. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that again is even sort of a bigger, more wide open, uh, set of options. Um, yeah, we have Adam, Rob and AKA Mamel all kind of popping in. Uh, Adam asks, does DS9 count as a ship? We talked about that last week, uh, because it's, it would certainly count as a hero, <laughs> something, whatever it is, but yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a space bearing vest. Space bearing vessel that technically can move. It does move in the first episode. Uh, so, I would cons. I don't know. It, it 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 walks that fine line between hero and recurring. Right? We they live on the station. I would probably not categorize it as a ship per se. <laughs> um, so yeah. As evidenced by the uh, fact that neither one of us picked it. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think <laughs> I can honestly. Say that I love Deep Space Nine, like the space station, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. get myself to the point where I would choose it last week uh, because, yeah, I have a hard time categorizing it as a as a starship the yeah. same way some of those other iconic things are. Um, mm -hmm. So, really looking forward to doing this, uh, and also a little scared at the same time because usually I think I'm, I'm usually pretty good about getting at least two of the five correct, and I'm not not totally confident I got any of them right. Uh, so that's yeah. a little intimidating. Uh, but before we do that, as we are one to do, uh, where are you on your rewatch? Uh, I actually have a quite a bit. I did uh, watch a few quite a bit. Let me bring up um, DS9 season two. Yes, I'll access. Yeah, CB, I'll access here and see what. Um, well, I saw you posted a poll about there. a specific episode, uh, Profit and Loss, uh, the Ferengi. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get to where I was i believe i was um 
maybe Paradise was the last episode yes. I had watched. We talked about Paradise um, last week. Yeah, so uh, I went from that to um, Blood Oath. Okay. Um, so that's like a four, yeah. four episode run, uh, which felt really good. Uh, I felt really good to get a run in. I think that was over maybe two nights or so. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, some really, I think, really solid episodes. I think there's some uh, really good Dax stuff. Yes. Uh, in this kind of run of episodes, mm-hmm. I think she's kind of coming into her own a little bit. I think. Yep. Uh, really early season one, she was kind of quiet and reserved. And I think there was a line maybe that in um, playing God, where she she, she even uh, acknowledges that Jedzia was a quiet kind of reserved thing, and that kind of plays into my kind of headcanon of okay, she's just she's she's still joined, she's still kind of figuring out these. She's changing um, because of yeah yeah of the symbiont and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I, I like that they. Um, I don't know if they meant to address that uh, per se, but I like that that kind of fits in my headcanon. But um, yeah, uh, I think all good stuff. I think my favorite run of the bunch is probably Blood Oath. Oh, yeah. uh, Blood I'm Oath's a great. big Klingon guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that maybe gives you a hint um, <clears throat> <laughs> as to what my picks are going to be uh, today, but um, just really good stuff. Uh, really good world building stuff for uh, Dax. I think there's some history from um, that we haven't kind of. I mean, we have dived into it, but this is kind of cool to see um, some backstory uh, with Dax as well. But um, yeah, all good stuff. Yeah, I think um, uh, that's definitely a good run for Dax and a good. You know, I think the point in the show that really kind of solidifies that sort of shift in her character, where she becomes a little bit more of a, you know, a rogue wild card, um, and not yeah. not as much of like a kind of cool, quiet, reserved science officer. Uh, Blood Oath for sure is a huge deal for her, making that choice to yeah. go off on this mission with those three Klingon guys uh, from the original series. Um, sort of the three big Klingons from the original series are, are back in that. And it's definitely one of my favorites of, se- of season two uh, uh, as a whole, actually. Um, I think all three of those actors yeah. are great. I love the, the sort of the, the tragedy of it all at the end. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, yeah. it's cool to see <laughs> Dax. There's some great uh, scenes between Dax and Kira. I feel like I remember, uh, you know, talking yeah. about, uh, you know, killing people uh, and how that makes you know how it makes you, you change how, yeah. yeah exactly uh, so the uh, good. Sorry. the thing about the ending of that episode is it's not really a happy no go lucky ending which I think Star Trek is kind of um, kind of stays to more like that wrapped up in a bow good feeling at the end sometimes you really you don't feel that here no yeah yeah, no, and I've talked about that a lot, I feel like, over the last few weeks, for, for whatever reason, I feel like it's come up, that I really like when Star Trek can do, like, an appropriately downbeat ending. I like when it kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, leaves you with a little little hole in your chest. Uh, uh, going back to TOS, there were examples of that, and I think it stands out when it happens, because, like you said, usually these episodes sort of, because of the episodic nature of most of Star Trek, a lot of the episodes are, are kind of intended to end on a, at least a restoring back to the starting point kind of um, situation, if not a feel-good situation at least. So having it be either a failure or you know not not around not arousing success uh, in, at the end of the day is uh, a refreshing change of pace. And Blood Oath, I think, yeah. definitely uh, fits into that category, and probably one of the reasons I like it so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, for me, uh, just to do mine real quick, uh, I am a little bit into Season 5 of TNG. I watched the first uh, eight episodes, I want to say, this weekend. Nice. Uh, Redemption yeah. Part 2 through Unification Parts 1 and 2. Uh, a lot of great stuff. Great run. Great run. Yeah. Really, really strong. Yeah. Uh, Redemption Part 2 is great. I love... I think that's really underrated, uh, actually, the, the whole two-parter. But Part 2, in particular, has Data in command of the Sutherland uh, and kind of going mm-hmm. mano a mano with... Yeah. Uh, his de facto first officer, who doesn't 
buy that he can do the job. Um, has to use his intuition to you know mm-hmm. kind of solve the problem. You got, I, I think I mentioned maybe on our Discord server um, in a conversation we had about it, just a quick back and forth. That it, I love that it plays so much on continuity uh, for a show that you know TNG certainly has a little bit of serialization to it. Uh, with Klingon stuff, yeah. and uh, but I think a lot of it comes back to sort of this. You know, Redemption builds off of Sins of the Father and Reunion, and even kind of going back to the em- Emissary, because it involves Kalar kind of oh, yeah. being a part yeah. of that whole arc. Um, and then you have uh, Yesterday's Enterprise paying off. You know, yeah, it, it, This is what sort of solidifies that Yesterday's Enterprise is not just like this sort of weird blip in an alternate timeline that never matters, that there are no consequences to. It's not just a simple reset. You know, there the, the there's dialogue referencing what happened in that, and the fact that Sela is here is is a result of the yesterday's Enterprise decision yeah. to send Tasha back with the Enterprise C. Um, I think I think that's really good stuff. And then, kind of right off of its heels, you have Darmok, which is just classic episode. And then Ensign Rowe starts to really lay the groundwork for Deep Space Nine with establishing the Bajorans and the Cardassian occupation and sort of laying down all that. You know, foundation mm-hmm. that Deep Space Nine is really going to build off of, um, and it's a strong episode on, on its own merits. It's sort of a classic bad moral story where there's a Starfleet <laughs> admiral who's you know yeah. got gotten c- kind of gone down the wrong path and um, is is trying to manipulate a situation in, in ways that are not uh, consistent with Starfleet uh, values. Uh, so the episode works on its own, I think, but it's impossible to kind of look at it without seeing it through the lens of setting up Deep Space Nine. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I like Silicon Avatar. I like Disaster, and Unification's great. Uh, Unification, I think, is another really big story that ends up, I think, building up a lot of things that come later on, um, setting up, you know, Spock going into the Kelvin timeline a little bit. I think there there's some useful information there about yeah. what, what kinds of things Spock's up to uh, yeah. at this point, and. Um, I don't, I don't know if we've talked about this or if you pay enough attention to like episode titles coming up, but not next week, but the following week uh, on Discovery, the episode is titled Unification Three, like Unification Part Three. So if you can figure wow. that out, I, I, yeah, I, I'm very eager to see what what that is and how that's possible. Uh, but it's written by <laughs> it's written by Kirsten Byer, so I'm sure she came up with some crazy way to. <laughs> kind oh, of man. continue that story, so it might not be a bad idea even for you to double back and rewatch Unification One and Two over the next couple of weeks <laughs> to uh, prepare for um, potentially some threads being capitalized on. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I'm really loving it. It's it's a I think season five of TNG I think starts maybe as consistently as any season uh, with just winners kind of right at one right after the other. There's a game which I'm not huge on. Um, in that run too, I think it's kind of just maybe a little bit below average, a little silly, but um, easy to forgive in the middle of a run that strong. Uh, but I think that'll do it for a rewatch recap, though. I think we've uh, mm-hmm. spent enough time on that and covered enough episodes. Um, so we're going to transition over to our handy dandy uh, guess each other's board. Um, we're going to go real small into the corner of the screen up in the top right, and uh, we're going to start populating this with our choices. Um, move this over a little bit here. Um, last week, I think I started by revealing my guesses for you. Um, I guess we can either do that again or we can flip it. What do you think? Do you need... Uh, it's up to you. I don't mind going first, I guess, for my guesses. Yeah, why don't you do your guesses for me, and then I'll do my guesses for you, and then we'll go into our actual choices and talk about, you know, why we picked what we picked. (laughs) Uh, uh, I am not confident at all, and, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just go for it, I guess. Just gotta go for Uh, it. Yep, so my guess is for you, um... Uh, for so number five is the Excelsior class, okay. uh, which is technically not a Kiro ship, but it is a Federation. I will say that I have Federation ships in my list as well that are not Kiro ships. Okay. Uh, so the Excelsior class is usually if an admiral is coming to the 
to the uh, Enterprise D. They always meet up. Uh, I feel like they use that uh, kind of style. Um, they do get a lot of mileage. Uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, so my number four <clears throat> uh, for my guess for Bill is the board cube. Uh, now this is my kind of thought process is kind of leaking into Bill's a little bit. I like when alien ships um, fit the style <clears throat> or the the mantra of that species. So to me, a Borg cube um, fits the mantra of the... So the, the Borg is always up per, at a quest for perfection, and I think the perfect shape um, is the Borg cube. Uh, so I'll put that up there as well. Okay. Uh, my number three for Bill <clears throat> is the Deep Space Nine runabout. I forget uh, what class that is, but um, yeah. I, it's I, all the runabout. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my number three. My number two <clears throat> is the Romulan Warbird, which is the T, um, which is the Derridex. TNG, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, era <clears throat> Romulan, uh, very massive, very menacing, very fitting, I think, um, for that um, species. Uh, and my number one, uh, I, I don't know, we'll see, uh, is the Cleon Bird of Prey. I think. It's a safer bet, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, again, I think that that ship really fits um, the mantra of the Klingon Empire. Um, so, in and out. So, that's my list. Okay. I think there's five there, right? <laughs> there's five. You did it. Uh, if I get one, then, or <laughs> if I get the same species, uh, oh, yeah, I'd be for sure. <clears throat> I'll say this. You didn't, you didn't do bad. Uh, we'll find out here in a okay. bit exactly how well you did, okay. um, but you <laughs> did not do bad. Uh, okay. Um, so my guess is for you. Again, I not a great deal of confidence here. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is a, I'm, I guess for that's, your that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Number five, I went with the board cube. Uh, okay. Number four, I went with the Romulan Warbird from TNG, which you picked for me. The Derridex, okay. which not that was kind of a late ad and a kind of a shot in the dark. Honestly, I'm not entirely confident in that one. Um, number three, I went with. The Klingon battle cruiser, mm. which is like the D seven, um, yeah, or the various, yeah, yeah, different iterations of that. Su yeah. Subtle little changes to that design that <clears throat> harkens all the way back to TOS and the motion picture, um, and we see a lot throughout. Um, yeah, get a mileage. Yeah. Yes, another one that we get a lot. Uh, I went with the Excelsior class for number two. I do have one. I, I can tell right now. I, I think I got. I think one of the places maybe I went wrong was not enough federation. Uh, and my number one, I went with Klingon Bird of Prey. Okay. <clears throat> the easiest part of this was I, I I knew there would be at least one Klingon thing, maybe two, because you you're like you said like you said when we were talking about Blood Oath, you're a Klingon guy. Um, yeah. The question was if it was going to be one, which one would it be? If, um, or if you would go multiple, uh, that, that 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 led me to some <laughs> questioning. <Yeah>. But <clears throat> so I'll tell you that you got two of my five right, um, which okay. isn't, isn't half bad. Um, how many did I get right from yours? You got. Three, right. Three, okay. Yeah, you did good. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should we reveal our actual lists and just... Uh, yeah, I think so. All right. Let's 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 do yours first. Okay. And then we'll so go So my town. number five... 
um, was the Klingon battle cruiser. Was the D seven? Okay. Uh, I think it was such a classic, um, foundational, like iconic. When you see that ship, when you see that style, um, it, it's really recognizable, and I think it really laid the groundwork for, um, for kind of what's to come. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my number four uh, was the board cube. Again, I talked about it when I talked about Bill's list. Uh, it's such a, I know it's such a simple design, um, but it, it, it fits the mantra, right? The perfection, but it also, the size is very menacing and very has, yeah, it just fits very well. It does. Uh, the, my number three, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Romulans had a war board, war, war bird as well. The style with the two nacelles on the end and the bird on the bottom. Yeah, from TOS. Yeah, the TOS, the TOS era. No, the Romulan. Romulan right? Warbird, yes. The Romulan yes. Warbird in Balance of Terror. Yeah, Balance of Terror. And they remade it in... Um, did they do, Was it in uh, Picard? What they? Yeah, they brought it back as like a throwback. It's basically like an old... Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's a relic Romulan ship. I, I really love that. I think it's a little bit more sci-fi, 60s sci-fi of the time. Uh, but I really, really, really do like that. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Classic episode, though. One of the best. Yeah. Okay. Was it, it's, it, was it only in Balance of Terror? So uh, it's in... Not a... No, it's in... They use it in um, uh, the remastered version. If you watch The Enterprise Incident now... Uh, the, you have the repurposed Klingon battle cruiser that they use in dialogue. They they reference as like this is a Romulan ship now, um, but there are okay. battle uh, there are warbirds from Balance of Terror in that fleet surrounding the Enterprise in the Enterprise okay. Incident too, and now it's in Picard as well. So yes, it is a recurring. Okay. you see it more than once for sure. <laughs> that was when I was like, <laughs> yep. I don't know about this. I knew it was in Balance of Terror, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, number two. This is probably going to be one you're going to uh, kick yourself for not guessing. Is the Delta Flyer, uh, which to me is a starship, starship, and to me is a reoccurring it is. Uh, ship. Uh, I freaking love that thing. I think it looks cool. I think it's um, the perfect balance between a classic interior and futuristic interior, which I love. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Bill was congr- correct in having my number one uh, is the Klingon Bird of Prey. And yes, I do have two Klingon things on my list. That's just how I roll. I just love Klingon uh, style uh, ship building uh, aesthetics. I think uh, I love the articulating wings. I think that's so cool. Um, I love that we get a lot of shots from, I mean... TOS movies, we get a lot of stuff from TNG. I just think it's it's a well used uh, ship, uh, but I think it's just it's so it just looks so cool. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I I I'm glad I got the Klingon stuff right. I got both. Um, yeah, that that feels good. I'm ashamed of myself that I didn't do the Delta Flyer. I think that yeah. was an obvious. You could have had my list miss. pretty much nailed down. Yeah. I could have. I definitely yeah. could have. Uh, AKA Mamel uh, makes a good point that 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 Romulan warbird design from TOS is it's it's slightly different because it's a hundred years earlier and it's got some modifications. But that rough design is used in Minefield as well in Enterprise when you see Romulan ships. Oh, right. Yeah, it's yeah, got yeah. it's it's yeah. it's a different it's a slightly different design, but yeah. it is that that basic outline of that ship um, for sure. So. Uh, mm-hmm. Credit there, aka Mamel for sure. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, and aka Mamel mentions, and this is where I got hung up on the Delta Flyer. We did the shuttle idea. That's, like, that's why I didn't. Mm-hmm. There was other shuttles that I wanted to put on. Yeah, and I. Uh, but hey, that's these lists are, are are you know, you can't you can't get too hung up on it's got to be this, it's got to be that. You got you can't do this, you can't yeah. do that. You just gotta get roll with it, go with your gut. Uh, yeah. like, and, and it is a recurring ship. It's not the hero ship, but it's it's in it all the time, uh, and it certainly but makes a big impression. Again, we go back to this argument of ship and shuttle. Yeah, you know nonsense. So, yeah. um, I'll just quote that. You know, if 
Bill and I made the, the rules, so uh, we can break them. So. That's true. <laughs> yep, the rules are made yeah. to be broken. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I love that you picked it. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. So I'll do mine, and then we'll have everything up on the screen, and we can kind of talk about uh, different things that pop out to us about each other's lists, each other's guest lists, um, and kind of just roll from there. So I'll tell cool. you that my number five was throwing some new tracks some love, uh, specifically Discovery. I went with the USS Shenzhou, uh, which counts uh, because we see the uh, the mirror version of it. Is that a hero ship, though? <laughs> nah, it's not a hero ship. It's, uh, you c if, if the show would have been the uh, Burnham Giorgio show, uh, if it was Star <laughs> okay. Trek Shenzhou. Okay. And you're right, been... you, you, it is recurring because we do see the, um, and, and, and not not in just one episode, right? We see it in multiple. We do. We see it in multiple, and even in, in the Mirror Universe, we're there in, uh, it's the Mirror Universe yeah. version of it, but we're there in Despite Yourself and The Wolf Inside, uh, in addition yep. to those first two episodes. So, I'm, I'm, I'm I, going. I love that, I love that ship just because it feels like a futuristic kind of uh, Miranda class, kind of. Yeah. Uh, but we get the kind of elongated, more futuristic, kind of cutting edge, like Discovery is. So, I think, uh, they, I think that's cool. I think they did a great job of establishing it as uh, it's. It, it feels futuristic and new and fresh and exciting for for Star Trek fans who are coming back into the show for the first time in a long time. And but it also feels kind of at the same time. I think it feels kind of old and raggedy and beat up a little bit and it feels like it's got a lot of mileage on it and I think Giorgio has a line mm -hmm. in Battle of Binary Stars about that that it's 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 seen seen a lot and it's reliable and she loves it but it's it's a beat up old ship uh, and I think I think there are little quirks in the design and uh, the look of yeah, the ship the, that the give bridge, it that bridge location is, is changed is at the bottom of the hole right uh, right yeah. yeah yeah it's at the cool. bottom of the hole you're looking down <laughs> into space yeah. I love the opening shot of uh, really, the the series after the the credit sequence um, of uh, you know coming up into the view screen and up to Michael Burnham looking out into space. I think I think there's some really yeah. great great stuff. Um, cool. Yeah. So I felt good about that one. Uh, I did go with the Romulan uh, Warbird from TNG era uh, as well. Okay. So that's made multiple appearances on these lists. Uh, the, the Daradex, I think, is the, the proper name for the class. Um, and you kind of said it. It's big. It's it's imposing. I love the fact that it feels like it's a threat to the Enterprise D, which I think is difficult to achieve at times. TNG, you know, leans so heavily into the Enterprise D being like a, a city in space. It's this big, powerful thing that can kind of dwarf these little freighter ships that pop up every once in a while that try yeah. to take pot shots at it. And, you know, <clears throat> even like a Klingon bird of prey feels kind of small and... Um, you know, out, out, outmatched by something as big as the Enterprise D. And when the Romulan Warbird shows up in the neutral zone with its really cool different design, I love the that there's a, the, the gap in the middle. So, like, when yeah. you, you have the flyby and you can see the D through the, the gap yeah. in the middle of the ship, I think there are some really great beauty shots allowed by that design. Uh, and But it, most of all, it feels like an imposing threat to the Enterprise D, which... Uh, feels needed and relevant. And we go back to it a lot. I mean, there are episodes throughout yeah. TNG where that's sort of, you know, they're staring at each other nose to nose. Um, and it's got to feel mm -hmm. like a tense situation, and it does because of the design of that ship, I think. Um, but I love that the, the beak style kind of just kind of resonates from Warbird. Uh, I do really like yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, number three for me, <laughs> I went with the Klingon Battlecruiser uh, from the TOS era. Um, okay. But the, the main reason I think I, I have to have it on here is is not so much TOS as it is the motion picture. I think that opening in the motion picture, uh, yeah. uh, the three battle yeah. cruisers with the music, it's it's so iconic and it's so like kind yeah. of delivers Star Trek into like this next step in the phase of, of like growth uh, from the original series. So much bigger, so much you know, bolder than what they were able to accomplish in the original series. And they, that's another model, like we said, that they get a lot of mileage out of. And I feel like because of how iconic it is when they bring it back in things like even like prophecy late in Voyager, when Voyager finds that Klingon ship out in the Delta that Quadrant whole, generational yeah, yeah. thing, like it just kind of gives yeah. you shivers. Like it's just cool. It's always cool to see. They bring it back in the enterprise. You see it in unexpected. And it's really cool to see. 
and even in Discovery a little bit. You don't get like, great views of it much, um, but in like point of light when they're talking about building the D seven, and you can see the the like sort of blueprint of it being projected into the yeah. Klingon, you know, uh, High Council. It, it's a it's a. I think the fact that it gets that reaction out of people when they see it speaks volumes uh, yeah. for for me. Um, so that had to make my list. Um, I went with um, the Borg Cube as my number two, and that's for similar okay. reasons. Uh, the The iconic nature of it, it, it the simplicity of it, yeah. uh, the the you know the going against the grain, going against the mold of going with these complex you know detailed designs and, and just doing something as simple as this kind of thrown together cube of technology kind of just I think I think it's intimidating yeah. and again I think the fact that it gets it, it's another one that they get a lot of mileage out of certainly and I do think maybe the difference is and maybe the reason I would almost flip these two um, if I could do it again is the battle cruiser gives me those, those those chills when I see it later on in the show and the board cube doesn't necessarily accomplish that like in later times you encounter it like in a later Voyager, yeah, it kind of maybe the maybe the the um, allure of it wears off a little bit. But in the best of both worlds, when they first oh, yeah. come across it with the big Ron Jones music, uh, yeah. the 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 threatening nature of that, everything in the best of both worlds with it really. And then first contact, that opening shot of not the opening shot of the movie, but, uh, yeah, the, the pullback inside the board cube, the, the revealing the massiveness of this uh, chamber of you know drones. Um, yeah, and then the, that looking up at it, kind of pulling toward Earth uh, at the beginning of the battle sequence and first contact, is is really mm -hmm. uh, some some of the most iconic stuff in Star Trek and certainly in the Star Trek movies. So uh, because it goes against the grain and because it's again such an uh, an imposing um, force, uh, mm -hmm. I had I had to go with it. Um, and then my number one. This this is a tough one, um, but I think for historic, for for the just the sheer impact of what it did, I, I had to go with it. I'm going with the Miranda class, and the reason for that is, and I, I don't even, I can't even say I, I completely like it. It wears off on me later on. We see yeah. it a lot in Deep Space Nine, and and in, in particular in this battle sequences. But when you factor in that. In the timeline, really, it's 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 really the first different design that we see, like in the Starfleet lineage of ships. Uh, in the original series, we only really ever see Constitution class ships, and in the motion picture, we only really see the refit Constitution class ships. You get little glimpses of like worker bees and shuttles and things like that, yeah. and, like, freighters. Um, but the Miranda class, for the, the in the form of the USS Reliant in the Wrath of Khan, sort of established what. Starfleet ships are going to be like they're going to have these common threads that bind these design concepts, um, and I think they always kind of harken back to, to to keeping a consistency that was established in Star Trek Two, and in Star yeah. Trek Two, I think they did just a, a perfectly brilliant job of like creating a ship that you know can easily be differentiated from the Enterprise, but comes from the same you know, line of ships that the Enterprise does. I think the fact that it is smaller, leaner, meaner, maybe more maneuverable, um, makes it an imposing threat to the Enterprise. Like, even though it's smaller and more compact, it feels like it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Enterprise. Uh, and those battle sequences in Star Trek II are some of the more successful things that I think the entirety of Star Trek has ever produced. And I think a lot of that is credit to that design, yeah. Creating something that is credible and feels like it, it can be a match and comes from the same, you know, it never pulls me out. Never, it, it, and, it, and it not only works for the for that movie, it establishes what, like I said, Starfleet lineage looks like in the form of its starships. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that the Miranda class, like once we're into TNG and Deep Space Nine, it's not my favorite ship to see because it's 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 old school and it's it's kind of like yeah. the easy thing to go back to. Um, but from, from the perspective of Star Trek II and what it brought to the Star Trek universe uh, and what it established, I, I had to put it on here. And Star Trek II is such a high point in Trek for me that it, it yeah. feels right to have it up there. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a great pick. Uh, the Miranda class, yeah, it's definitely, um, like you said, it definitely set the uh, set the bar, set the mold for kind of what's to come, I think. Um, you know, even other ships, uh, you know, I'm forgetting a class, but it's like the, the Enterprise <clears throat> D's uh, saucer, but then two, that's kind of just... Nebula class, echoes, yes. Yeah, the Nebula class is echoes of Miranda, I think. Um in that, you know, we're, we're we're starting to create ships that are, are maybe smaller and more compact, uh, but really do have that um, familiar aspect of, of feeling like part of one kind of federation yeah. uh, style. So, yeah, that's a great pick. Um, kind of kicking myself that I didn't throw that on there for you. So, so we both we both have one <laughs> on our lists that I think do that. I think I, I'm regretting that I didn't. Throw the Delta Flyer on my guesses for you, and yeah. you're saying the Miranda class <laughs> for for me. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. But I also think it's it's I think it's impressive that we kind of landed on each other's kind of roundabout. Like we, we both got the Bird of Prey. No, I didn't put the Bird of Prey on my list, which was a late late yeah. cut. Um, yeah, I, I I toyed with which Klingon ship do I prefer, and I, I think the Battle Cruiser is more iconic. Um, the Bird of Prey certainly has its its moments, and it gets more mileage for sure than the Battle Cruiser. Oh, yeah. right there. I mean, we see it so much <laughs> yeah. more. Um, yeah. In, in in so many of the shows, and it, it's great. I mean, I love it in Star Trek Three. I love it in Star Trek Six. Um, and in, in, in we, we're on those ships a lot in in uh, TNG and in Deep Space Nine, the, the Bird of Prey. So it feels kind of yeah. dirty not to have that on there. Um, but I, I wanted to. I think one of the things in on my list that. Uh, probably a trademark of mine with with these things is trying to diversify and give uh, give some love to some different things. Uh, yeah. I, have, I have five different kinds of you know so uh, no four I guess two Starfleet uh, four Klingon and Romulan making up my list. Yeah. Um, a had... uh... sorry. Good. No. Go ahead. You you. A late cut for me was the twenty second century Vulcan. Like the circle, oh, with yeah. like the, the arrow. I think that's so of Vulcan. It's yeah. it's so I love the circle, like with the straight streamlined. It just feels so logical and and, and looks fast. Um, that was that was tough for me uh, to cut off, but um, yeah, those those Vulcan yeah. ships <laughs> in Enterprise do <clears throat> do work really well. They feel much more advanced than the Enterprise does. They feel like they can kind yes. of squash the Enterprise if they wanted to. Uh, it makes yeah. NX-01 feel kind of quaint. Um, and I think that's critical to the sort of premise of that show. I think it's one of the things mm. that allows Enterprise to feel like a prequel and feel more primitive, even though, you know, the challenge for Enterprise yeah. always was from the beginning, you know, convincing people that this is a ship from 100 years before Kirk, even though... You know, Kirk's ship is from the 1960s, so there are all these things that have to like layer on top of each other to make it kind of work in the minds of enough people for the show to be successful. Yeah. And I think one of the ways they achieved that was to make the Vulcan ship so much, you know, kind of more imposing and more more advanced. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was a successful choice. So that, that, I'm glad to hear that was a late cut for you. I it was definitely on my long list of like things I jotted down to kind of start yeah. from. Um, from each show, mm -hmm. I kind of did that. Like when I do these kinds of things, a lot of times I find myself like thinking, "Okay, let me think about Enterprise for a few minutes," and jot yeah. things that just kind of pop into my mind, even if they're not like going to make the list. If I know they're not going to make the list, I'll still write them down just to have like a big um, mm -hmm. set of things to just look at and to maybe talk myself into if if I need to. Um, in, in Enterprise, some of those indie designs also uh, mm -hmm. are recurring. And none of them I would have. None of them kind of rise to the level of any of the things that I chose in, in my opinion yeah. but there are a lot of things from Enterprise um, and I'm glad you named it uh, the, the, yeah. the Vulcan design because Enterprise doesn't make an appearance on our list at all um, no. either any of our lists guesses or actuals um, yeah. and if we're talking if Delta Flyer shuttles runabouts all those things are, are <laughs> eligible the shuttle pod from Enterprise yeah. is definitely up there for me and you know, one of the yeah. things we didn't you mentioned it with the Delta Flyer a little bit um, but if we're talking interiors, like the, the sets for, for these, some of these designs, you know, I, I think, uh, the, the shuttle pod, the Delta flyer, some of those shuttlecraft 
definitely uh, benefit from looking at it from that angle too, the interior as well as the, 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 the exterior design of the ship. Um, yeah. But from the, the things on my list, the board cube interiors definitely played a big part in oh, rising yeah. that up. The, the, the production design, the set design, uh, the art direction of those scenes taking place on the board cubes. going Ranging from q who the first time we're on one up to picard i think they find cool ways to kind of expand that give give fresh uh takes on 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 the same sort of idea uh while staying true i think to uh what makes sense uh in the lineage of the show Uh, i think that was the production design of the borg stuff from top to bottom is is really successful and plays a big part in why they i think the borg he probably made both of our lists um yeah and to be honest, the, the the thing that has me kind of regretting not having the Klingon Bird of Prey on my list is that we see so much of the interior of that Bird of Prey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's Ooh, another yeah. ship that yeah. I feel like I could almost navigate if you drop me into it. Because I feel like in Deep Space yeah. Nine especially, but some of those Klingon episodes, we feel like we spend so much time on those bridges and in the corridors and in the mess hall. and <laughs> like It's kind of as well fleshed out as as anything, really, the, the, the interior of the Klingon Bird of Prey. But I love it because it's so fitting of that yes. species of that you know it's it's so dark and dingy and it's yeah. not pretty it's, no. it's functional it's, it's functional. you know it's it's yeah <laughs> it, but it's got its own like I love the the design of their console interfaces and like it's just so well developed like everything yeah. in the Klingon universe like Klingon stuff can be take it or leave it for some people some people can get bored with it and it's not it's not their thing yeah. but the thing you can't deny is that time and effort was spent. On developing this this society, this culture, the the, the technology, the, the the production design of these different things, and it all kind of feels like it's of a piece uh, from from top to bottom. And I I think yeah. um, remarkable consistency given how many changes the Klingons have kind of over you know gone through, going back from TOS through the 90s stuff and even into Discovery, like, there have been some shifts in the way the Klingons are presented, but I think yeah. it all kind of, you can you can headcan in a lot of things into just kind of settling into place, and the Klingon uh, society feels like a lived-in, uh, well-developed place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, anything else? So, you're, you're saying your toughest cut, your number six, was the Vulcan design from Enterprise that we saw the most of. Yeah, just because I, I I really like that. I think that's probably one of my favorites uh, of that show. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we get a lot of um, uh, stuff with the NX class um, mm-hmm. and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I really do, uh, do like that. Because, again, uh, a lot of my picks stem from, okay, does this ship fit? Um, the 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 species, or when I think about uh, that species, like if I think about a Vulcan, you know, it, it, what pops into my mind, and mm-hmm. it's and it's really that ship for me. So, um, you know, we get we get a lot of Andorian stuff. I'm not so hot on those. Um, they kind of feel, um, you know, normal. They don't feel unique. Uh, but I think uh, with that Vulcan ship, I think it's, it, I I think it's cool. Yeah, no, I I couldn't yeah. agree more. Um, yeah. Some of my tough cuts uh, were the Klingon Bird of Prey. Obviously, is the one that I'm regretting as I'm sitting here. I'm wishing I could find a way to get yeah. it on there. Uh, but yeah. beyond that, there, there's some really cool stuff in Deep Space Nine with the Dominion. The Jemadar Raider is a cool design. Uh, the, another one that's just kind of imposing and scary. Um, the um, I've never been a huge oh. fan of the Cardassian ship, like the the Galore class. Something about yeah. it just kind of I I, it, it, I don't I'm not going to say I, I dislike it, but it never rises to this kind of level of oh, man. I love that it's it's there. I I think it's fine. It makes sense in the concept of the. I think it kind of it feels at home with Cardassian architecture and kinds of design concepts that they lean into. But um, I, I can't sit here and say that I I was tempted to put it on my list. But it is heavily featured. I mean, there's certainly a lot of another one that get, they get a lot of mileage out of that design. And it's the same thing with me with the Ferengi stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just those like I I tried to think of the big, you know, Star Trek species that we see, and a lot, it, yeah. the Ferengi the, the Ferengi stuff just doesn't really 
this doesn't really do it for me. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, I think that actually came true as I thought about a lot of the different like recurring species in some of those later shows. I, I couldn't bring myself to do anything for Rangi Cardassian from Voyager. I couldn't do like Kazon ships. I couldn't do Vidian stuff. Yeah. I couldn't do Herogen. Like I couldn't. I couldn't talk myself into edging those things onto a top five list instead of some of the more iconic stuff that is on both of our lists. Um, yeah. Like the Borg Cube and the Klingon Battle Cruiser, things like that. Or, or just, they just make a bigger impact on me and I get more of like a, wow, that's so cool feeling every time they reappear in their, yeah. in their basic, I mean, something like, they, I know if you go into the really nitty gritty of the, the, the design details, there are some variations of that Klingon battle cruiser that you could, you could like parse which one, like the D seven, the, the, some of the mm-hmm. later versions. Uh, but just that, that overall outline of a ship, I think is as cool as it yeah. gets. And just kind of dwarfs like the Kazon ship. For example, like the the big yeah. Kazon, like huge um, yeah. thing. Uh, but it was cool to kind of rack my brain and think about these different shows. Like I said, my whole process was kind of like, okay, let me think about Enterprise for a few minutes. Then I thought about TOS and each show as I kind of went along. Yeah. I thought about things that popped up more than once and just threw them down on a piece of paper. And I, you know, once I had it all down, I kind of just went through and circled the ones that were like the obvious. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think I got to about seven or eight that were like really tough to, to not have. Uh, and the, the, the big one that I'm regretting is definitely the Klingon Bird of Prey, which is your number one. Uh, so your number yeah. one's not on my list and my number one's not on your list, which is an interesting uh, yeah, that's, that's comparison. Cool. Yeah, for sure. This, this kind of process definitely helped me uh, for next week um, because, you know, I would, I would think about ships and the, ships that really stood out to me and i'll be like oh you know that's only in one episode or, and that's only in one movie so um i think uh this one definitely was tough but i think next week is going to be even tougher i think to even get one uh on the board so for sure <clears throat> yeah next week with the one-offs will be I think even more interesting because there's so many yeah. things to play from uh, and there are some good ones there are some really good uh, options that I think I right off the bat pretty much know are yeah. going to be on my list. Yeah. Um. Uh, before we kind of wrap up, uh, I kind of want to mention some Star Trek content. Sure. Uh, there is a new fan film out, Pacific 201. Uh, definitely go check that out. The Pacific 201 ship uh, is freaking awesome. It looks really cool. There's some great shots in that film. Uh, definitely go check that out. Yeah, I, I agree. I haven't seen it yet, um, but I've kind of followed along with that process going back quite a few years now, and I'm eager to see what the the yeah. beginning of the finished product looks like. Um, eager yeah. to eager to I, check it out. I want to say we've done an actually Trek Live episode on we did. two on one, so definitely uh, drop this week. So definitely go check it out for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Star Trek content for me, I I'll throw out there. Um, there was a lot of the great Star Trek uh, podcasts out there cover uh, New Trek. Uh, I think the start that the Trek geek guys do a really nice job of recapping uh, the Discovery episodes. Um, Discovering Trek is their show uh, where they where they kind of unpack all the new stuff. There is the new official Star Trek podcast that I think I've mentioned before, uh, the Pod Directive. It's called, hosted by Tawny Newsom uh, for one, and her friend. Um, uh, comedian Paul F. Tompkins, um, but uh, Tony Newsom is uh, Mariner from Lower Decks, so it's kind of cool to hear her voice uh, talking talking yeah. Star Trek. And uh, this week's episode is a interview with Jeff Russo, who does the music for uh, Discovery and Picard. Um, and he's always got interesting things to share and uh, perspectives to explore. So uh, that, that's always a good show. I, I've kind of grown to really like that um it's kind of an interview format kind of thing they always have different people on talking about star trek um and uh it's cool to have an official you know produced star trek podcast uh at this point from from star trek so uh yeah check those two out um trekmovie.com actually has another uh, is another one it's a good show that unpacks the, uh, the latest episode of Star Trek uh, Discovery or Lower Decks if you go back far enough. The uh, It's called All Access Star Trek. Um, 
if you look that up, you'll find some some quality content, recapping episodes, giving honest assessments. Like it's not it's not just pure uh, complete adulation. No matter what they 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 dig deep, but they're positive and and um, you know it's not a it's not a hate watch recap by any means. Yeah. Um, and I, I always take something away from their conversations. So a lot of good stuff out there. Yes, that's for sure. Um, we'll be back next week to talk about the one-off ships, um, which should be really fun. Um, and then we'll be back next week uh, to recap the next Discovery episode on the sister show. Um, so all good stuff. Agreed. Yeah, Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern Time for Core Setting. We'll be talking about Scavengers, the new episode of Discovery. It'll be airing on Thursday. And uh, Sunday, 10 a.m., as we are today uh, to talk about one-off Star Trek ships, guessing each other's favorites. Yeah. So we hope okay. you'll join us for both. Um, look for this on YouTube on Tuesday uh, around 6 p.m. Eastern time. This will post as a YouTube video uh, recording, and I believe you'll be able to find it on the Trek Live podcast feed as well. Um, so yep. you can subscribe. You go to anywhere. Go to your Apple Podcasts or wherever you look for podcasts, I believe. Um, and you should be able to find Trek Live, and uh, hopefully moving forward, you'll you'll be able to access these uh, if you prefer to listen. Um, yep. But that being said, that I like that we have the accessibility uh, to be able to listen to it anywhere, but I think the best experience is to be here live and be a part of the discussion, uh, like some of the people uh, that were here today. So For sure. Yeah, we appreciate everybody who stops by and takes part in the actual live broadcast of this. Uh, we, we, we love to read comments on air and have it influence our discussion. Uh, and today we had Rob in the room, we had uh, Adam in the room, and uh, AKA Mamel contributed some thoughts as well, um, as, as she is one to do. And I saw some other people kind of pop in and out as, as well, and we, we appreciate anybody taking any time to click the link on on Twitter or on Periscope to, uh, to check us out even for a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, we'll see you next weekend. Appreciate everybody stopping by watching this or listening to it. However you found it and, uh, yep. stay tuned for more. Yep. Thanks for watching everybody. Thanks.